questions for you. And you, so Susan, tell us your story about how you approach this. Cause I'm not sure, like you could see it in the, um, you could see it in profile, but I'm not sure we got the full appreciation though. When you walk up and it's like, it's the, the, the metal ages naturally and you can use products and normally would just be not quite, not quite garbage for us. But one of the issues that happened in paradise is um, it was all pine. So what were you going to do with that? So please take this away and have the conversation and share with us your vision and all. I'd love it. Jennifer, first of all, I just want to really thank you and everybody in this audience for inviting me. I am a stranger to your world in many ways. I did not go through the fire I did not, I've not gone through a natural disaster um, in my life. I've gone through personal traumas and experienced intense grief. But I can't say I've shared your experience of combinations of fear, danger, and grief. And it's really an honor to be part of your community. And it's a thing that I felt from the very first moment when Jonathan approached me in Portland of uh, March of last year and said, would you help us design some houses that will bring back life into Greenville? And I think the power of that moment and the power of it, the instant yes, that I of course delivered to Jonathan about as fast as I could give him a hug even though I'd only met him like 30 seconds before, was that it was an opportunity as an architect to give back to a community that needed it, to give back to so many ways in this community that architects often get a bad rap. You know, you design houses for rich people, you design corporate office buildings, you design Google campuses, blah, blah, blah. This was an opportunity to be as humble and as giving, and as urgent, and as fast, and as competent, and execute flawlessly within a three-month period. We met in March, we were contracted in April, and by July we had building permits into the, into the county of Plumas, and we were building that July with shop drawings to do that mass timber. And that process was in one of the most intense of my professional life, one of the most gratifying, and I'm deeply grateful to all of you for welcoming me into your community in Greenville, for allowing me to have that chance to give back to that community and hopefully to many others in this community, because we can do this. We can build back, and augmented with the incredible depth and knowledge of Jonathan's circular economy vision, which is so often thrown around as a buzzword, circular economy, we hear it in Amsterdam, we hear it in London, we hear it in, in, in New York City, but to really see it in action and to see it happening right now with trees, with real trees, with burnt trees, with a live tree, with a dead tree, with a utilization plant, with a sawmill, with people running that sawmill, with CLT panels being fabricated, yes, not from the wood yet, sadly. That's the next step that, that Jonathan's already talked about, but it's going to be happening. And then to have those CLT panels from the same region, the Cascadia biome, from Southern Oregon come down and be mounted onto those houses and to have KD moving into them within the next couple weeks, I hope, to walk in there and photograph them and provide a shelter, a place of stasis, and a place of hope for a community was incredibly empowering for me as an architect. And I'm just very honored to be here and thank you for your time. So Susan and I, I'm gonna pose the first sort of dilemma. We were talking last night and we just said, why is it so difficult and why does it take so long? A question I know many of you can answer, but when we talk about the crisis, it's also why I asked the question of Senator McGuire this morning about how you do recovery that actually simultaneously builds capacity. We all recognize the need to build capacity but I don't think we constantly think about that, except of course when it's not there, and go, oh gosh, we really need this. But when we simply, and it's not simple, when we simply contract for various remediation activities, we can build in the state, Cal OES, uh, FEMA, state parks, uh, Cal Recycle, we can build in a different process where they're actually contracting more with locals. It's not saying the locals can do it all, but it is saying they can do a heck of a lot. Because when you experience something like the Dixie Fire, our local contractors, and particularly our licensed timber operators, they're out of work. They're not working unless they're driving water trucks or doing that sort of thing. But when you 
bring in the contractors and let a $68 million contract and they're bringing all out of area contractors, that's not building capacity. It is remediating a problem which is good, important, critical, but it is in and of itself insufficient. And it's little different than the $1 billion contract, $1 billion contract that goes to Tetra Tech to deal with the campfire and all the out of area contractors coming in. So I'll get off that horse for a moment and back to this issue of how do we move this quicker? And I will now say that I've kind of knocked Cal OES and so forth and the lovely thing about the lead for Cal OES is after Cal OES and FEMA and state parks came to this campus to say, this is a great place to take logs. This is a great place to take some of the concrete that's gonna come out of the houses said, yeah, and you all can do more. And I was then having weekly calls with the Cal OES director to talk about issues that we collectively are facing and how they can handle it better. So kudos to them for the recognition of that, but also recognizing the barriers that they were facing. But back to building. So thanks to Plymouth County Planning and Tracy and others for the rapidity with which they reviewed plans, got things through to make things happen. And the reason the houses weren't done sooner is we ran into supply chain problems. What a concept, right? We had trouble getting windows. We had trouble getting all sorts of things to get them through. Uh, thank goodness for Dr. Johnson because they said when, as Susan pointed out, we met at the Mass Timber Conference and she said, I will get you panels. We will make it happen. We will wedge these things into our production line and we'll do it. So uh, that's Dr. Johnson and they're not making panels anymore right now, but uh, thank you to them for making it happen. One of the messages is reaching out for help for people who maybe don't know exactly what you've all been through, but can help and want to help desperately. The other message that I take this from is what I just am blown away by Jonathan. I've only known him for a year, but I've seen him in, a, in the power of peak of his action. Being able to harness the resources that you saw on that screen, it's not just glowing you know, pictures and graphics up there. That's real people doing real stuff fast all the time. Every time I, I, I've had spent the most time with Jonathan, I think at this conference, and it's been, we actually had conversations. I actually found out a little bit about him. I think I've got to know him a little bit more because every time we talk, he's got like 30 things happening and he tells me as fast as he can. And I understand about three of them. I just know what I have to do, which is two of them. And I go do those two things and I do them hopefully as well as I can. But in the meantime, he's working with an entire panoply of you, the community out there as fast as he possibly can working vertically integrated. And I, I don't say that to flatter Jonathan, just although I totally am blown away by him, but I'm also, it's such an inspiration. But for me as a, as, a, as a human, for me as an architect, for me as a business leader who leads my very small architectural practice, which is not a nonprofit, but sometimes it feels like that. And to be able to, how do you harness our energies in this world and move things forward as fast as possible and as impactfully as possible. And every single person has been up here who has talked and in this audience has shown some of that amazing work that Jennifer has done, I, you know, I guess six years ago, I just met you a half an hour, an hour ago, but uh, you know, or the, some of the folks out here that I've just heard your stories again and again. To finding that galvanizing power of action it's kind of a blessing in a certain way. I mean, I don't want to put a Pollyanna spin on what happened to the tragedy here, but you all, you people are incredibly inspiring and I'm grateful to be among you, as I said. I just want to make sure we follow up to figure out how to take your already done plans and get them to the next level of fortified and wildfire prepared. Because it's very easy once we have plans to like take it through that process and get it stamped. That way, then people can go in and say, I want the single bedroom or the two bedroom, and it's like pre-prepped. That's an awesome comment, and that's exactly why we, we, we donated our plans or almost donated them to Plumas County as a master permit work, um, because we felt really strongly that we don't want to have to reinvent other people to reinvent the wheel over and over again. We've done the work. We've got it permitted. We got it all through the codes. We're updating them to the most recent codes again, because guess what? It was at the very end of the code cycle last time. Now we're just moving it forward through Plumas County. We'll have that done in a, in a matter of probably a month or so, uh, and these 
the, the houses themselves represent that circular economy that, that Jonathan was mentioning. One of the things that's really powerful about this material, he kind of alluded to it with this burning, I helped rewrite the codes for mass timber for tall mass timber buildings in the US. I spent two and a half years pro bono on that effort. As part of that, we had to do fire test after fire test after fire test. Five fire tests in a national laboratory outside of Washington, DC. And I have a different relationship with fire than most of you in this room because I saw it through a, 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 a wire glass frame. I was up two stories. The wire glass cracked on me. We all like freaked out and stood back. It didn't crack open, luckily, but there was so much heat coming off of those two-story mass timber buildings, which we burned up with so much fuel load, way more stuff than anybody ever had in their real house. And we burned it up for four hours, no sprinklers, no fire department I intervention. The, the model was, hey, the fire department just didn't make it that day and the sprinklers went out. What is gonna happen to these structures? And they didn't burn down five times in a row in the summer of 2017. That was a huge eye-opener to, to the fire community that I was working with, which was on the regulatory side, you know, uh, fire chiefs from Cleveland and who were been writing building code for maybe 10 years post 9-11. Uh, they were really people that were studying fire and they wanted to know deeply the impacts and what's the difference between light wood frame, which means two by sixes and two by fours at Home Depot, versus mass timber, which is huge and thick and four inches and 40 feet long and from here to there and puts, is put on on panels. And those panels have a totally different relationship to fire than, the, than a typical stick frame. And it's what, as Katie has said, it makes him feel safe uh, when he walks into his house uh, because it, it's not that Katie should be in that house during an event. He promised me he would get out, but hopefully his house is standing when he comes back. I'll geek out just a little bit more by saying you can find online explosive testing of mass timber buildings of like the three little pigs, the little, the middle, the bigger one, and they thought the little might go down, and 610 pounds of TNT was exploded in front of these three structures, a giant fireball hits the building, and all three survived, and Department of Defense, which was involved, uh, the individual basically said, and I know this from uh, somebody who was standing next to the Department of Defense official saying, we need to rethink this stuff for our defensive purposes for military. So if it can stand up to that, it's, I, I wish we had a house in Greenville that was made out of this, like we have now, to see what would have happened in the Dixie Fire, but I'm way more confident in, and just another note, stick frame construction, legitimate construction for sure, but when fire gets in, it burns around the two by sixes and what have you, and it burns very quickly because it's oxygenated, has plenty of air to burn, whereas the mass panels don't have oxygen or precious little in between the layers, so it just chars. And we've all seen those pictures of the steel drooping when they turn to fire. So we're pretty excited about what can happen with this. The other thing that is really powerful for me about our mass timber houses and Jonathan's circular economy work is that we sequester a lot of carbon in those panels. When the forest is taken down like it was in a fire or it needs to be thinned like it up in my area and all of the forest restoration work going down here, those logs, you know, not the tiny four, three to four inch hemlocks like I'm making down off my property in Mount Constitution and Orcas Island, but you know, six inches plus and above, that can be cut into those two by sixes and two by fours and made into the mass timber panels. And why we can't do that with ponderosa pine is beyond me, or why the market has decided that ponderosa pine is not the thing, but Jonathan's gonna change that. He's gonna be doing that in his, in his mill, and he already is, and we're gonna be pressing those panels. You know, In the next few years, I'm hopeful that that will be happening. And to be able to sequester the carbon from the burnt ponderosa pines into the houses is, of course, the dream of how this whole circular economy will, should happen and it will happen because of the energy of this community, Sierra Institute, and Jonathan. You've been very patient with your question. Thank you. Sorry. I, um, no, I just wanted to, and this, this is so, so interesting, but it goes away from the fire retardant capabilities. And I just want to expand your horizons and your model and take it to post-hurricane forested areas, Florida, Puerto Rico, all the southeast, all the north plains, um, there's an enormous amount of wasted timber 
after large events and in Florida, we just, we wanted to utilize the down timber, but we could not get the equipment from the Northwest because of the season. And so trying to think through that problem is something that um, I will probably be emailing you about. <laughs> So I want to make you aware of that. I'll look forward to it, and I know some people we can have some conversations with about that for sure. Yeah, that's an awesome model to consider. Um, one of the things about using timber in the southeast, of course, is the termite issue, and it's one thing that hasn't been completely solved. Um, it is probably going to mean a spray, but for the Formosa termites, for instance. But there's so much you can do for detailing. Of course, you can't expose this material to the outside anyway because you've got rain and it's a structural material, and we don't want it to, you know, to collapse under the rain um, or to eventually degrade, degrade over, uh, with rain. So it's typically on the inside and. And it's protected very well, very well detailed. You can see it in KD's houses in, in Greenville. Um, and so the, the termite risk, I believe, is low. But then I hear these pictures, you know, stories of people with <laughs> these flying termites around. And I was like, I'm not a termite person. There's probably something to it. And so I do think uh, being thoughtful about that is a, is a key thing. But in terms of the strength of the wind loads for the hurricanes, seismic stuff as we just talked about. There's a, there was a 10 story shake test that just happened about two months ago down in San Diego. They built a structure 10 stories high out of this material and subjected it to not just one earthquake, 10 stressed earthquakes, 100, 100 stressful earthquakes. They subjected it to every known earthquake that they have tracked that they've got data on it. And the, the thing would just like, yeah, boom, stop after the forces were subjected to it. So we can handle hurricanes. Hello. Um, I just want to make a comment, a couple of comments. First of all, my day gig pre-fire, I'm, I'm a landlord for moderate income rental properties. I've seen what tenants can do to properties. The first time I walked into these structures, I realized a tenant could swing an eight-pound sledge at one of these walls for an hour and really not do much more than put a few dents in it. So when I look at the stability of these structures for their long term, now that's not an encouragement for anybody to do. But Put that sledgehammer <laughs> down, Katie. <laughs> um, when I look at the, the strength and durability of these from a landlord's perspective, they're a great value. So the durability for whatever kind of disaster they might face, I think is just huge and off the scale um, to any other form of construction that I've seen. And second of all, I want to give a big shout out to Jennifer because today she created an environment where a group of us from Plumas County came together with Susan. We finalized a deal for a multifamily housing project, 20 to 30 units right in downtown Greenville, ground zero, and we're going to initiate that. Thank you, Jennifer. But we didn't... We didn't just talk, and my job in here is I write checks, so I'm going to write the check for this real soon. Things are going to happen. There's going to be boots on the ground doing real things. Thanks to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Aww. <laughs> I also, um, and you know, I, I just want to say this too, is so much of the work that we do, we're like, oh, we've suffered. And then if, in order to be like resilient for climate, um, because we all have climate doom on some way, like, oh, we're just going to have to suffer some more and we're going to have to live in ways that we don't find beautiful. And I love this in particular because it says bullshit. We can have beautiful um, climate resilient housing. It can be gorgeous. It can be, we can be proud when we walk up to it. It can be preferred. It can be better than what we have now. It can be better for the environment. It can be more beautiful. And we have so many communities. I'm just talking in this country right now. I know there are other countries where this is true, where once the timber industry left, there was nothing left to replace it. These were, you know, these were towns that we abandoned economically. And then we wonder why maybe there's a large part. So I'm not going to get political, but a large part of America that's a little upset. And I'm, this is like one way, I'm not saying this is everything, but like these sorts of ideas, and this is the sort of um, innovation that doesn't leave the economic 
revitalization because it's not it's not like it's we're not rebuilding an economy in many ways we're coming back and we're starting a new economy that has been abandoned for decades that's one of the reasons why i like it because those are the communities that i work in all the time and many of you live in and they deserve that and we can't and it is where naturally affordable um, naturally occurring affordable housing exists so when i get a call from a reporter from you know, one of the big newspapers like Wall Street Journal or New York Times, and they're like, well, why are we spending taxpayer money so people can live in the woods? And I say, under which overpass would you like them to move? And finally, last year, the Washington Post pulled the quote, and they made it big. And I was so glad, because I don't want to hear any more from um, people who think like, oh, well, if you're living in the woods, you're stupid somehow, or you're unsophisticated, or you're unimaginative, or what is your problem, or why should we pay for you? I don't buy that. That's just not true. But having innovation come straight from there, very proud. Senator McGuire was absolutely right in saying we just can't keep building further and further into the forest and create more communities that are going to be surrounded by densely packed trees. But it doesn't mean, and that's not the same as saying you can't rebuild in a place like Greenville, where it really is quite unlikely for the fire of the sort that it was a tornado, it was a fire tornado, more of what we're seeing. And unfortunately, we are going to see more of these, as I think all of you know. But we have to think a little bit better in how we respond and how we manage our surrounding landscape. So another reason we are doing landscape work is because you probably heard it before, but I'll say it, it's not just the wooey. We have to manage entire landscapes to help catastrophic wildfire and landscape fire begin to lay down prior to hitting the edge of the wooey or a half a mile or a quarter mile from a community. So this is all part of that larger effort to address some of these issues. Okay, last question. Um, so you're, you're right. I think that rather than saying we can't build in certain areas, we need to recognize what the risk in those areas are and then build appropriately to meet that risk. I, I, I used to work as a licensed architect myself, so Susan, I want to talk to you. But um, I have a couple of questions. One is about the buildings that you're doing. Are you going to, you've talked about the building sitting on a footprint. Are you going to follow the guidelines of wildfire prepared home with the five foot non-combustible zone, no wood fences, no bark mulch, et cetera, et cetera? Yes. Perfect. We already have. Thank you. They're done. And it will be- We followed all the WUI guidelines. And it will be maintained that way, right? There's not much to maintain. I mean, I can't speak for KD about his what he puts in as a landscaping thing right. uh, later on. So there may be something, but there is no vegetation on the site, and we have a very, very, very low. Uh, I don't. There is no vegetation that we're putting in. Um, but the most important thing, the wooey stuff, the wooey pieces, that that all of the exterior is non-combustible, including the standing scene roof and the eighth-inch core tan steel around the edge, around the whole entire stop. We've put a, a, what we call a wet core in the middle of it. So in the middle of the house, all of the major systems are held. Their utilities, are, those utilities are going in underground mm -hmm. through a crawl space and then up into the middle of it with this prefabricated core in the center. There is very little that could be taken out in that, in, and that crawl space also keeps the wood up off the ground. All of the detailing has been carefully done so there's no ember catching in, in that world. Um, and it's a beautiful space. So. That's great to hear. And the, the last question I had was, the, was about the laminated timber. And the, um, in, in not too distant past, just the last few years, I worked at the state fire marshal's office, and one of the challenges that we were seeing with early mass timber, and hopefully you being on the committee that solved, maybe has solved this, but what we were discovering through testing was it wasn't the timber products themselves, it was the laminates that were being used. And there, at the time... The laminates, you mean the glues? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I can address that. Yeah, the adhesives. So it w there wasn't a lot of um, standards. So a and, couple of things, yeah. Well, yeah. all I was going to say was we were seeing a lot of failure in different types of laminates yeah. depending <laughs> upon who was building it with what materials yeah. and you know, the okay. bad actors in the space that were trying to cheapen out uh, were, were 
creating products that were failing pretty badly. I don't know where you got your information. Sounds like a lot of it came from the concrete industry. I'll be frank. There was a lot of bad, the, a lot of bad information was being circulated, and we did have some some pushback from some of the California fire chiefs in the beginning because of that of that misinformation. Also, I got to say, you're making me sweat like bullets here because you're bringing back a very uh, difficult time of my life sitting at that table with those 18, six of, the, six of them were fire folks. And we had this conversation again and again and again. We got through that because of those tests. Now there's a lot, there is some truth to what you're saying and that is that the, the standards, they had been, they, do, they did exist, they do exist, they've been, they've been improved, but the PRG 320 standards were in place since the very beginning of the codes. They wouldn't have been allowed into the ICC without standards. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the, there is a heat rise at the glue line. This is after you've already burned through two, uh, an inch and three quarters of a typical lamp stock, and that takes, that takes about two and three quarters of an hour to even get into close to that zone. There is a little bit of a flare up, and then, like, this is like a huge heat curve, and then it goes up a little bit, and then it comes kind of back down. There was a little flare when that happens, and then over the four hour period, you're burning about another half an inch, quarter to a half an inch of the second lamb. So now you've got a three lamb or a five lamb, and those are structural elements. When you burn through that inch and, inch and three quarters, plus maybe a quarter, so let's call it two inches total, there is still enough structure behind that to, to maintain the structural integrity of the structure so that it's not a danger, even though, yes, you see a little flare up. Now you can take that information and blow it out of proportion, and you didn't, I know you didn't mean to, but there, there have been uh, industry, it, let me be clear. We are changing, to build tall timber, we are, building, we are changing the way we built in the 20th century for the better. And to change business as usual in this country of a multi-billion dollar industry, of the construction industry, is incredibly difficult and it has incredible economic impacts for some of the major players like the oil companies, like the, like the cement, like the concrete factories and the steel co companies. And that does not go over lightly. People do not just turn over and say, cool, Susan, go build some CLT. So there's a lot of things that I sadly kind of ran up against going through that process, and it, it did kind of wipe some of the naivete off my eyes. But I'm happy to talk to you further, and I'm happy to be super transparent about the tests. I can give you all the data, and I'm happy to talk to you further. Perfect. Thank you. Jennifer, if I may just say, now you all know why we're working with Susan in terms of the knowledge. Then there was one notable failure at PV Hall at Oregon State with uh, some ma a mass timber product from, in fact, D.R. Johnson. Didn't. Uh, we were not concerned about going to them for panels because of the safety of the panels, the things that they instituted post that failure. And we all know that when you make things, sometimes they don't go quite as you planned. One side note, I don't want folks to walk out of here being confused. So I thought Susan was going to pick this up. The generic term is mass timber. Cross laminated timber is a laminated product. So you take two by sixes, and then you cross lay them with a layer of glue or adhesive in between. So we have three layer, five layer, seven layer systems. You can also fasten them with nails, nail lamin nail, cross nailed timber. You can uh, fasten them together with dowels, cross doweled timber. So there's a variety of ways to connect the material. Generically, they're mass timber. We're talking about cross-laminated timber for these houses along with the facility that we want to build because of the consistency in the product that we can make. So, and the efficiency of that as well. And my last point, when the LA Times staff came to me and asked about why we're building in Greenville, I said, we're doing it along coasts, aren't we? Are we telling them to stop building along coasts? The seas are rising. How about the liquefaction zone in LA? Are you stopping? She said, okay, point made. You know what I always say? Are you going to move the tribes out of the forest? Every time. They're like, oh, yeah, we're not. So there you go. But I do agree. No 400-unit subdivisions in Arizona with no water. Sorry. Side note. Thank you so much. Round of applause.